Shall I just go ahead? Okay. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm uh, Patrick Wen. I am a professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School, and I direct the Center for Neurooncology at Dana Farber, and also the Neurooncology Program at Brigham Women's Hospital. So it's a real pleasure and honor to, to be here. I'm going to change my title slightly. I'm going to talk not just about glioblastomas, but also gliomas, since there has been a lot of progress uh, in this area over the past few years. And please feel free to uh, stop me at any time if you have questions. Can, can you hear me OK? Yeah, it's good. So th these are my disclosures some of which are relevant. So I'm going to talk very briefly about the 2021 World Health Organization reclassification of brain tumors that really has had a major impact. I'm going to then talk very briefly about the medical management of brain tumors. I understand that many of you are neurosurgeons and the neurooncologist approach is sometimes slightly different from the neurosurgery approach. And then I'll spend most of the time talking about IDH mutated gliomas and then at the end on glioblastomas. So glioblastomas occur with an incidence of three to 4% per 100,000 and the IDH mutated gliomas are, are rarer. Beginning in 2016, but solidified in 2021, the WHO integrated molecular diagnosis with histologic diagnosis in the classification of these tumors. And this has had a, an important impact on both the classification of these tumors and the treatment. The over 15 subtypes of gliomas have now been condensed just to three types in, in adults. So there are IDH mutated astrocytomas, IDH mutated oligodendrogliomas, and glioblastomas, which are now all IDH wild type. In the past, until this updated classification, glioblastomas were diagnosed by histology. And when you do that, about 10% of glioblastomas had IDH mutations. And this 10% of patients had a much better outcome. With the new classification, these IDH mutated glioblastomas are no longer considered glioblastomas, but instead are called astrocytoma IDH mutant grade four. Glioblastomas are now restricted to the histologic um, IDH wild type tumors with, with the uh, pseudopalisading necrosis and microvascular proliferation. But in addition to the majority of these tumors that have this uh, histologic finding, it now also includes a new category. So these are lower grade tumors by histology. The pathologists will call them grade two or grade three tumors, but they're IDH wild type and they have the molecular alterations of glioblastoma. So they have to be IDH wild type, and they have to have one of these three changes to promote a mutation, EGFR amplification, or gain of chromosome 7 and loss of chromosome 10. Any of these in the setting of IDH wild type would make them a molecular glioblastoma. This new classification has some implications in that hopefully it improves the diagnosis and classification of these tumors and allows a better understanding of the prognosis and the optimal treatment for these patients. In terms of clinical research, it allows for a more homogeneous population to be enrolled into clinical trials and hopefully facilitate the development of targeted therapies. This new classification has uh, clinical implications, and I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but these are two reviews that we published in the past year that discusses the clinical implication of the WHO classification, and we'll go into the treatment plans in, in greater detail. 
So that's all I'm going to say about the classification. Are there any questions uh, at this point? Uh, Professor, we will take the all two questions after your lecture. Okay. Continue. So I'm going to very briefly just talk about the medical management of brain tumors, which uh, as neurosurgeons, you, you will frequently come across. So the, as you know, these tumors produce a lot of peritumal edema through production of VEGF, and it's an important cause of morbidity. And we use corticosteroids to treat these tumors. And the standard dosing in many countries is often 10 milligram bolus and four milligrams of dexamethasone four times a day. But in fact, although the pharmacologic half-life of corticosteroids is short, the biologic half-life is actually much longer. And the, the four times a day dosing was uh, proposed by Galicic in 1961, and then everybody's just been using the same dosing all these years. But in fact, you don't actually have to give it four times a day. So there's a complete split between how neuro-oncologists and neurosurgeons give steroids. Neuro-oncologists give the steroids once or twice a day, and neurosurgeons often still give it four times a day, even though it's probably not necessary. So hopefully I, I can convince you to try to give the steroids less often and certainly don't have to wake the patient in the middle of the night to give the steroids. Steroids also, in addition to all the side effects you know and all the cushionoid features, may have an effect in, in decreasing prognosis, both in preclinical models and in three data sets in patients. The administration of steroids results in a worse prognosis. And it's not just because these are big tumors with a lot of edema. Even in patients with a gross total resection of the tumor, the administration of steroids is associated with worse outcome. And so ideally, you would taper patients off steroids and use it only in, if necessary. And the, the practice that's prevalent in, in many centers of keeping patients on steroids in case they might get edema from radiation should not be routinely pursued. In terms of prophylactic anticonvulsants, the current data suggests that if you have a brain tumor and you've never had a seizure, there's no clear benefit of prophylactic anticonvulsants. And the recommendation is to taper these patients off within a week or two of the surgery. In fact, there's not actually clear data that prophylactic anticonvulsants is even beneficial for preventing seizures from surgery. And then the third common issue, especially in patients with glioblastoma, is the development of venous thromboembolism, deep vein thrombosis, and pulmonary emboli. A number of studies, including the CLOT study that's now almost 20 years old, suggested that the use of low molecular weight heparin is more effective than warfarin. And that has been the standard of care all these years. But recently, there's been a lot of uh, use of uh, direct oral anticoagulants in, for cancer patients and for other diseases. But there's always been a concern about whether these drugs are safe in brain tumor patients. And this is one of about four studies now that suggests that in brain tumor patients, these direct oral anticoagulants are safe, in fact, possibly safer than low molecular weight heparin. And so we have tended to use these instead of low molecular weight heparin in brain tumor patients now, if they have no contraindication to any uh, anticoagulation. <clears throat> so I'm gonna switch and talk about treatments and novel therapies. There have been two reviews from the Society for Neuro-Oncology and one in conjunction with the European Society of Neuro-Oncology on these tumors, one for glioblastoma and one that was uh, published online recently for IDH mutated gliomas. So I, I refer you to these for more details. In the past few years, there has been really significant uh, advance in the thinking of how to treat IDH mutated tumors. 
and a lot of novel therapies under consideration. I think for grade two gliomas, if you can have a gross total resection, and if they're under the age of 40, they're considered to be in a good prognosis group. And usually you can just watch these patients. For patients that are considered to be at higher risk, that's patients with a subtotal resection or who are older than the age of 40, treatment is usually considered. <coughs> there have now been multiple phase three studies looking at the treatment with standard therapies for grade two and three gliomas. And all of these studies show the same thing. The addition of chemotherapy to radiotherapy results in improved survival, both for grade two and grade three gliomas. For grade two gliomas, especially those who are IDH, the addition of PCV chemotherapy for carbacin, lomustine, and vincristine significantly improves survival. The top panel uh, shows uh, oligodendrogliomas who have the best outcome. The middle panel shows benefit even for astrocytomas that are IDH mutated. And I think what's surprising from this study and also from the Catnon study that I'll mention in a moment is that for the lower grade gliomas that are IDH wild type, so these are the molecular glioblastomas, that doesn't seem to be benefit from chemotherapy. For grade three astrocytomas, the Catnon study has shown that a year of, so radiotherapy followed by a year of adjuvant temozolomide significantly improves survival. And this is now the standard of care for these grade three astrocytomas. One of the issues is whether giving temozolomide during radiation therapy is of benefit. And in the second interim analysis published in 2021, the addition of chemotherapy during radiation was not statistically significant. Although, as you can see here, the curves actually separate. And so one wonders whether with uh, larger patient numbers and longer follow-up, whether there is some benefit. For grade three oligodendrogliomas, there have been two phase three trials that suggest that radiotherapy in combination with PCV chemotherapy significantly prolongs survival compared to just radiotherapy alone. And then recently uh, in, in JCO, the long-term follow-up of these patients was published from both studies. And I think what's remarkable is that for grade three oligodendrogliomas, a 30% of patients had not progressed after 20 years, and just over a third of them are alive. So there are subsets of these patients that actually do really well over the long term. One of the sad things about this, though, is that these patients have had radiation, and after living 20 years with a tumor, a lot of these patients have neurocognitive problems from the radiotherapy, even though the tumor has not progressed. There is a big debate in our field regarding whether to use PCV, which was the combination used in all the phase three trials, or whether we should use temozolomide, which is better tolerated. And so there's a trial called CODEL that's underway that compares these two. And we, in a few years, we will know those results. So in summary, for lower grade gliomas, grade two and three gliomas, Patients with gross total resection and under the age of 40 can be watched, especially if they have grade two tumors. It's a little less clear if they have grade three tumors. But for patients with subtotal resection or who are over the age of 40, treatment with radiotherapy with chemotherapy should be performed. Now, all these in, in the new classification, all these low grade gliomas have IDH mutations. IDH uh, 
converts isocitrate to alpha ketoglutarate, alpha ketoglutarate normally. In the presence of a mutant IDH, alpha ketoglutarate is converted to an oncometabolite to, called 2-hydroxyglutarate. This accumulates in very high concentrations in the tumor and causes epigenetic changes in tumor genesis. And, and the hope is that by inhibiting mutant IDH, you can reverse this process and, and control the tumor. A number of uh, studies with IDH inhibitors have now been conducted. The first in class was the drug called ivacidinib, which is an inhibitor against IDH1. And this uh, showed that in grade two gliomas, a significant number of these patients had stable disease for prolonged periods. We didn't see a lot of actual tumor regression. When you have tumors that look stable, it could just be that they're actually growing slowly and it just takes you a while to figure it out. So we did careful uh, segmentation of the scans to see if there really is a real benefit. And you can see the small tumor increasing in size over time. And then when they're on study for the next 17 months, at a minimum, it's stable, but may actually be a little smaller. So what we think happens with these IDH inhibitors is that the tumor is growing, and then on the inhibitors, you may not get regression, but you get slowing of the growth and stabilization of disease. The same is true of a follow-up IDH inhibitor called varicidinib, which is more brain penetrant and inhibits both IDH1 and IDH2. We then conducted a surgical study where we gave patients who had recurrent low-grade gliomas either the varicidinib, the IDH1-2 inhibitor, or ivocidinib, the IDH1 inhibitor. And treated them for a month, and then they went to surgery. And we examined the tumor for drug concentrations and also for 2-hydroxyglutarate levels to see if it inhibited the molecular pathway. Uh, this is untreated tumor, and this shows the inhibition of 2-HG with it and with it. And so you can see that with both drugs, there is significant, more than 90% inhibition of the pathway, suggesting both drugs could be active. Ultimately, it was taken to a phase three trial where patients with grade two gliomas were, who had had only surgery but nothing else were randomized to varicidinib or a placebo. And then the primary endpoint is progression-free survival. This trial has completed accrual and uh, the results will be known this year. And so by the end of this year, we'll know whether there will be an IDH inhibitor that's positive <laughs> for these tumors. In addition to using IDH inhibitors, there are multiple other therapeutic strategies that are being looked at. The high 2-HG levels affect homologous recombination repair, which makes these tumors sensitive to PARP inhibitors which as you know, are approved for breast and ovarian cancer. And so trials combining POP inhibitors with chemotherapy for these tumors are in the way. There's also a lot of studies looking at the metabolic vulnerabilities of these tumors. Uh, one <coughs> recently described <coughs> pathway is the pyrimidine synthesis pathway. These tumors are very sensitive to uh, pyrimidine nucleotide synthesis and use of a DHODH inhibitor that inhibits this pathway results in tumor growth and clinical trials with these agents are planned. There's also a lot of interest in immunotherapies. The IDH mutation is a mutation that once it's present, persists throughout the duration of the course of the tumor. So it's not lost in the same way that other mutations like EGFR can sometimes be lost. And so potentially it's a good target for, uh, for immunotherapy and vaccines. 
uh, Michael Platten and his group in Heidelberg has been looking at an IDH1 vaccine, and he showed that it was safe, that you can generate an immune response. And about a third of the patients had pseudoprogression, transient worsening of the tumor that improved with time, suggesting that there might be a biologic effect. His group has also shown that the, the high IDH sorry, the high 2-HD levels in these tumors is actually very immunosuppressive. And so you can imagine a strategy where you use an IDH inhibitor to knock down 2-HG and improve the immune response. And then you can combine that IDH inhibitor either with a vaccine or with PD-1 blockade or other immunotherapeutic strategies. And so we have a trial that just opened combining vorasidinib the IDH12 inhibitor with pembrolizumab, a PD-1 antibody for the higher grade IDH mutated gliomas. As I mentioned earlier, we recently published a, a review from the Society of Neuroncology on these IDH mutated tumors that summarizes all these strategies in more detail. And I refer you to that review. So I'm gonna switch and talk about glioblastomas. This, as you know, has been a very difficult area. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of treatments for our patients. Over the years, there have been very few approvals by regulatory agencies for glioblastomas. And I think there are many reasons for this. One of them is certainly that us as neuro-oncologists have to do a better job. This is a wonderful slide that Skip Grossman from Johns Hopkins gave me, purportedly from uh, an American Indian tribal wisdom. It says that when you discover you're riding a dead horse, the best strategy is to dismount. But many neurooncologists try other strategies. We keep telling ourselves the horse is not really dead. This horse is no deader than any other horse. We attend conferences like the Society for Neurooncology to learn how to ride dead horses. And we hitch several dead horses together to make them run faster, combination therapy. And we really have to do a better job identifying and retiring these dead horses. As you know, surgery plays a major role in the diagnosis and treatment of these tumors. And the first step is to try to achieve maximal safe resection. But you have to have more than 78% of tumor resection to have any impact on survival. Recently, the Rhino group came out with this new uh, category of tumor resection that is associated with prognosis. The best category is supermaximal uh, resection, uh, maximal resection of the contrast enhancing area is the next category, and then the submaximal resection and biopsy. Standard therapy currently for glioblastomas is 60 gray of radiation therapy over six weeks, together with concomitant temozolomide and six cycles of adjuvant temozolomide. And with this treatment, the median survival is increased a very modest two and a half months to 14.6 months. Most of the benefit is in the 40% or so of patients with a methylated MGMT promoter. For the majority of patients with the unmethylated MGMT promoter, there's really little or no benefit with temozolomide chemotherapy. <clears throat> Another treatment that is approved in some countries are tumor treating fields. These are electrodes placed in the head that deliver low intensity intermediate frequency current, which is thought to disrupt mitosis. And I think to the surprise of many, in a phase three trial, the addition of tumor treating fields to the adjuvant temozolomide resulted in a 4.9 month improvement in median survival. With a median time to progression of only seven months, the patients recur and we have to think of other treatments. Surgery has a role if 
you can achieve complete uh, resection of the recurrent tumor. Otherwise, there's no real impact on survival. And all the other treatments listed here, including chemotherapy and re-irradiation and bevacizumab, do not have a significant impact on survival. And so there's a desperate need for better clinical trials in this setting. Bevacizumab, the humanized anti-VEGF antibody that's approved in some countries, is very effective in reducing peritumal edema. And it has a real effect in improving the quality of life of these patients. But the study that was conducted by the EURTC adding bevacizumab to lomustin did not find that it improved survival. Although it has to be said that many of the patients in the control arm also received bevacizumab at progression, diluting any potential survival effect. <clears throat> With the increasing understanding of the molecular drivers of tumors, there was so much hope that targeted therapies would be beneficial. And we certainly understand the molecular pathogenesis of glioblastoma as well as most other cancers. But unfortunately, this has to date not really translated to improved outcome. There are many reasons for this. Our preclinical models are not very good. There's a problem with the blood-brain barrier that excludes many of these agents from reaching the tumor. We don't have a lot of easy targets like BRAF, V600E mutation. There's redundant signaling pathway, spatial and temporal heterogeneity, and many other factors. Tumor heterogeneity is a huge problem for glioblastomas. Tumor cells, even in the same area of the tumor, may have different gen genetic drivers and different cellular states. And this study with single cell sequencing showed that in glioblastomas, there are four main cellular states that are influenced by the tumor microenvironment and the tumor genotype. But these cellular states can are plastic, so they can transform into each other. And whereas in other cancers and in perhaps the lower grade gliomas, there's a hierarchy where the stem cells can multiply, but as they differentiate into tumor cells, the tumor cells cannot multiply. With glioblastomas, the glioblastoma tumor cells can also de-differentiate into stem cells. So this plasticity makes targeted therapies very difficult. There's also, in addition to spatial heterogeneity, temporal heterogeneity, the change in tumor genotype over time. This is um, fortunately less of an issue with copy number changes, but with some mutations, for instance, EGFRV3, which is one of the main molecular drivers, that can be lost in up to 50% of patients in recurrence. And so knowing the patient's genotype at diagnosis may not be very predictive of the genotype at recurrence. There's also the issue of the blood-brain barrier that excludes over 90% of cancer drugs from being useful for brain tumors, and it's a major problem. There, there are many strategies trying to overcome this. Perhaps one of the more promising ones is the use of uh, focus ultrasound. There are different techniques to do this, but the focus ultrasound with microbubbles potentially opens up the blood-brain barrier for a number of hours allowing your therapeutic agent to cross the blood-brain barrier during that window. Despite all these problems, there has been some progress in the last couple of years. Uh, last year, we published the results of a basket trial that looked at two drugs, dabrafenib and trametinib, a RAF and MEK inhibitor for rare gliomas that have the BRAF E600E mutation. This mutation, as you know, is, is prevalent in melanoma and, and has led to very impressive response rates in that tumor. For glioblastomas, the response rate uh, in tumors with this mutation is 
And for lower grade gliomas, the response rate is 69%. To put this in perspective, the response rate of glioblastoma to temozolomide is 5%. And the responses for these targeted drugs are durable. This just shows the response with the dibrafnib trametinib in the study compared to the historic data for different drugs for glioblastoma. And so based on this and, and other studies, uh, the, this combination was approved in the US for all solid tumors, but really for the first time, also for glioblastomas. <clears throat> there are other targeted drugs that are shown some promise. Uh, TREK fusions are particularly sensitive to uh, therapy and this uh, NTREK inhibitor showed relatively high response rates and is brain penetrant. And then at the last ASCO meeting, this uh, fibroblast growth factor receptor inhibitor, erdafitinib, showed responses in about 21% of patients that was also somewhat durable. In addition to the traditional therapeutic targets from molecular therapy, there are now new molecular targets that are emerging. There is increasing evidence that the growth of glioma cells is dependent in part on neurons. Michelle Manji showed that neurons release neuroligand-3 that stimulates the growth of glioma cells. And this neuroligand-3 is cleaved from neurons by atom-10, and atom-10 inhibitors potentially inhibit the growth of gliomas are in clinical trials. And then more recently, there is data suggesting that neurons form synapses with glioma cells through AMPA receptors. And drugs that inhibit AMPA receptors, including the approved uh, anti-seizure medicine, parampanol, has an anti-tumor effect, at least preclinically. Whether it does so in patients remains to be determined. The WHO classification also separated adult from pediatric uh, type diffuse gliomas. And in the pediatric group, many of these have molecular drivers. So pediatric low-grade gliomas, many of them have BRAF KIA fusions or BRAF E600E mutations. And treatment of these tumors with MEK inhibitors have shown high response rates this is an example of a patient treated at our institution with a MEK inhibitor. And then treatment with um, BRAF B600E mutated pediatric low grade gliomas with dibrafenib and trametinib has shown a much higher response rate than standard chemotherapy, shown on the panel on the right, and an improvement in progression free survival compared to chemotherapy. With the BRAF KIA fusions, standard RAF inhibitors don't work. But there are uh, type 2 RAF inhibitors that have been developed that do work in these tumors. And recently, one of these, Day 101, or tovarafenib, the preliminary results were released, suggesting that there was a 64 risk, uh, overall objective response rate in these tumors that was durable. And almost certainly this drug will get regulatory approval later this year for BRAF uh, KIA fusion uh, gliomas. Many of these are, are pilocytic astrocytomas. Another area where the targeted therapies have shown benefit are in these very difficult to treat H3K27 and midline gliomas which includes the diffuse intrinsic pontine gliomas. There's a drug called ONC201, that's a dopamine receptor D2 inhibitor, and also a CLIP-P agonist that shows responses of about 20 to 25%. So it's not very high, but once you get the responses, they're very durable. And the drug is very well tolerated. And this, this is just from that uh, study. So to summarize for targeted therapies, there are now a small subset of glioblastomas that are amenable to targeted therapies. 
and the novel targets, I think, do hold promise. But there remain significant issues of heterogeneity and redundancy of sigmoid pathways, as well as the problems of the blood-brain barrier that remain significant obstacles. I'm going to switch, and uh, in the last part of the talk, I'm going to talk about immunotherapies, which, as you know, has been a major area of interest in cancer. Glioblastomas <coughs> have a very suppressed immune system. 40% or more of the tumor have an immunosuppressive microenvironment with M2 macrophages and immunosuppressive myeloid-deprived suppressor cells. The tumors make immunosuppressive factors like IL-10 and TGF-beta. And the chemotherapy and radiation we use produces a profound lymphopenia. And many of these patients are on steroids. There actually have been a lot of studies of immunotherapies for glioblastomas. One of the first was this uh, peptide vaccine against uh, EGFRV3 that unfortunately was negative. There have been continued interests in peptide vaccines against single targets, and uh, one uh, targeting survivin showed in a, a phase two study potentially improved outcome compared to historic control, although you have to take these results um, with some skepticism because these patients have gross total resections and they're not on steroids, and so they're selecting good prognosis patients. But a phase three trial evaluating this vaccine in the adjuvant setting is underway and it's very well tolerated. There has also been a lot of interest in a dendritic cell vaccine called DCVAX. The primary endpoint of uh, progression-free survival was not different between the vaccinated group and control, but there was a lot of crossover. Mm -hmm. And so the investigators compared the survival from the study with historic controls and it appeared to do better than the historic controls. There have been some issues about the nature of the uh, historic controls, and, uh, and this has been uh, discussed in detail in a recent editorial in Neuro-Oncology, and I refer you to that. I think perhaps the one of the most uh, exciting areas of vaccine development has been in neoantigen vaccines. Uh, Kathy Wu at our institution has developed a platform for developing neoantigen vaccines, and my colleague David Reardon has been leading the glioblastoma trial. These, and, and with these vaccines, the patient's tumor is sequenced. They have whole exome sequencing and RNA sequencing. Then 10 to 20 new antigens are identified and a personalized vaccine is made. They were able to show in a pilot study that you could generate an immune response against the new antigens, but only in patients who did not have uh, steroids. Once they went steroids, there was no immune response. The study now has moved to a second phase, combining the vaccine with the PD-1 antibody, Prembolizumab, and it's ongoing. There's also been a lot of interest in checkpoint blockade, which, as you know, led to the award of the Nobel Prize a few years ago. There were rare patients with germline mismatch repair deficiency that were very hypermutated that appeared to have responses to PD-1 blockade. But as we know in the subsequent years, the use of PD-1 antibodies against glioblastomas has not been helpful. This was the Checkmate 143 trial used comparing nivolumab with bevacizumab and recurrent glioblastoma, showing no benefit. And then more recently, nivolumab has shown no benefit in newly diagnosed unmethylated glioblastomas and newly diagnosed methylated glioblastoma. It turns out that glioblastomas have very few of the characteristics that would make them sensitive to checkpoint blockade, and in particular because of paucity of T cells in the tumor. 
they're considered what's called code tumors, as opposed to hot tumors like melanoma, where they have a high number of T cells. And so many of the current strategies are developed to try to convert these code tumors with few T cells into hot tumors with more T cells. There are many strategies that are underway, combining vaccines with checkpoint inhibitors, viruses, targeted therapies, radiation, mm -hmm. and many other strategies. There was hope that combining pembrolizumab, the PD-1 antibody with uh, anti-VEGF therapies might be helpful. But in a study that we recently published led by my colleague, David Ridd and, and Lachmi Nayak, there was no benefit to adding pembrolizumab to bevacizumab. Another approach is to use the checkpoint inhibitors prior to surgery, so-called neoadjuvant approach that has shown benefit in other cancers. We did a study where we gave patients with a current glioblastoma either pembrolizumab before surgery or nothing before surgery. Patients went on to have surgery, and then everybody got the pembrolizumab afterwards. And we were able to show that the administration of even one dose of pembrolizumab increased the gamma interference signature, it decreased cell cycle genes, and there was patchy increase in CD8 inflammatory infiltrate. And I think to our surprise, the patients who had neoadjuvant pembrolizumab, who, who received the drug before surgery, did better than those who received it only after surgery. And so there was a lot of excitement about maybe this is the way we can give uh, pembrolizumab. Unfortunately, we recently did a validation study that did not replicate this result. And so we, unfortunately, this is probably not a true result. But regardless of whether this is a more effective treatment, giving these agents before surgery allows us to look at the tumor immune response and study combinations. And so there are many trials using this approach to look at combination immunotherapies in glioblastoma. Another area where there has been a lot of interest has been with viral therapies. In the past, these viruses were made to kill tumor cells or to introduce a suicide gene, but it turns out that these viruses are also very irritating and potentially can induce a profound immune response and convert these cold tumors into hot tumors. <clears throat> there have been many uh, viruses that are under treatment. Some of these, unfortunately, have not been helpful. The most well-known one is probably the poliovirus, which in a phase one study from Duke University suggested that there may be a, co a, a, sec a, a proportion of patients that appear to survive longer, possibly due to an immune effect. We joined them in the validation study, and it replicated the same findings, but did not produce a, a better result. Whether this group of patients benefited from the virus from an immunologic effect, or whether there's a component of selection bias is unclear. There's also been a lot of interest in adenoviruses. This is a study of the adenovirus DNX2401 in pediatric diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma. These patients lived 17.8 uh, months, which is somewhat longer than you would expect. The average survival is usually about a year, and they were able to generate an immune response. At our center, my colleague Nino Chioker has been developing a herpes virus that grows through the tumor, killing it, but also induces an inflammatory response. And this is one of my patients that he treated that clearly had a response. Other herpes viruses are also being evaluated, and this one in pediatric high-grade gliomas also appeared to have slightly better outcome than historic controls, and there was evidence of generation of an inflammatory infiltrate. And then perhaps the virus study that has generated most interest is this one from Japan, where they looked at a herpes virus but unlike the other studies, they gave 
multiple injections, up to six doses. And with this approach, uh, in these patients with recurrent glioblastomas, they had a one-year survival rate of 84.2%, which is much higher, as you know, than you would expect. Again, whether this is because of the virus and the multiple injections, or whether these patients were highly selected remains to be seen. And there are other studies looking at multiple virus injections on the way. There's also interest in combining these viruses with checkpoint inhibitors. This is the adenovirus DNX2401 with pembrolizumab. And the response rate was a relative modest at 12%. And patients lived about a year. So it's possible that, sorry, they, they lived about 15 months. So it's possible that there may be a benefit, but again, it's hard to know for sure. We've also been interested in uh, looking at the combination of virus and checkpoint blockade. CAN2409 is an adenovirus that transduces tumor cells with thymine kinase gene, sensitizing them to the antiviral valocyclovir. In preclinical studies, the combination of the virus with PD-1 significantly improved the survival of orthotopic models compared to virus or PD-1 alone. And so we've <coughs> conducted a phase one trial in newly diagnosed glioblastomas who were injected with a virus after surgery and then had valacyclovir together with standard radiochemotherapy and nivolumab. And there was an extensive immunologic correlates and the preliminary data suggests that the injection of the virus using Cytoff showed increased uh, upregulation of some sets of uh, CD4 cells. And there was an increase on the O-link assay on various cytokines and increase in gamma interferon. And then finally, the area of immunotherapy that's perhaps attracted the most interest have been CAR T cells. This, as you know, has produced major results in lymphoma and leukemia, including possibly cures. The idea is that T cells are extracted from the patient. Uh, chimeric receptors are engineered to be expressed on the surface of the T cells. They then reinfuse into the patient, and these T cells home to the tumor and produce an immune response against the tumor. A number of years ago, there was an example of a patient with a glioblastoma with leptomeningeal spread that had the uh, T cells injected into the ventricles and showed a response that lasted a number of months. But in general, CAR T cells to date have not shown significant benefit. The study of CAR T cells against EGFRV3, which is present in about a quarter of glioblastomas, suggested very little benefit. And if you look at the resected tumor, there were only a small numbers of CAR T cells that actually reached the tumor. And there was upregulation of immunosuppressive factors, including PDL1, IDO, and FOXP3. So the more current generation of CAR T cell trials have tried to combine them either with PD1 blockade or with intracranial delivery. But there remain many challenges with CAR T cell. There are paucity of unique tumor antigens on the cell surface. There's tumor heterogeneity. Antigens like EGFRP3 can be lost over time. And there's limited traffic of CAR T cells to the tumor. And this is a severely immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. But despite this, there are many CAR T cell trials uh, in progress for gliomas. And the one area where there has been some real glimmer of hope has been the GD2 CAR T cell against these very difficult to treat H3K27M mutated diffuse midline gliomas, including diffuse intrinsic pointing gliomas. This study done in Stanford, um, they reported their first four cases. And here you see a patient with DIPG that showed a clear response to the CAR T cell. And this is a spinal cord tumor that again showed a clear response. 
these patients can get very sick, but they've done a great job in supporting these patients and getting these really amazing results. And then in, the, in our field, you know, the way we've been developing drugs has been really slow and inefficient, and the current paradigm is not working very well. So there have been a number of efforts to try to speed up the efficiency of drug development in neuro-oncology using these platform trials with Bayesian adapter randomizations. The first one of these trials is called the INSIGHT trial that we started at Dana-Farber with a number of collaborators where patients undergo hoaxum sequencing and then they're randomized to standard of care or initially one of three arms. And the trial learns over time which arms are working better and increases the randomization into that arm and decreases the randomization into arms that are not working better, eventually killing off the arms. Because these are platform trials, you can add arms and drop arms without having to write a new protocol. And then on an international scale, GBM Agile is using the same approach. And uh, currently there are, there are six arms uh, in the trial. And so this is hopefully a more efficient way to screen novel therapies and not have to have a control for every uh, new treatment, but to share the control arms. So hopefully the, these approaches will help us find better treatments for our patients. So to summarize, that there has been some progress, but there's still important challenges to the development of effective therapies, and especially the issue of the blood-brain barrier and tumor heterogeneity remain major obstacles. But I think in the past few years, there have been targeted therapies for some rare subgroups of patients in the adult uh, world and more patients in, in the pediatric age group. I think immunotherapies and oncolytic viral therapies may have potential, although it has yet to be realized. And we need to do a better job to improve the quality of the trials and accrual. But I think, you know, in a field where there has not been very much progress, I think, you know, my dose of Prozac has certainly gone down and my need for these other things have also gone down. I think there is some hope or optimism. This is my clinical trials up to clinical trials program at Dana-Farber that's co-led by my colleague uh, David Ridd and, and uh, I want to thank you for having me uh, be glad to answer questions. Thank you so much Professor. Uh, Nana? Uh, thank you so much and I apologize for uh, these technical issues earlier. Uh, okay. I wanted uh, to ask a uh, few questions. Please. Sorry, uh, before the questions, before passing the questions, I want to uh, give the floor to people. Okay. First, uh, okay. Marika Mott from Virginia University, and then Professor Yunus Aydın from Istanbul. And then uh, maybe you can make a, a quick uh, introduction. Instead of beginning of the lecture, you can introduce Professor Van now. Oh, um, apologize for that. So. I, yeah, Professor Wen was uh, so he, he graduated his primary uh, training at uh, um, Saint Bartholomew uh, University in, in London, and also the his primary uh, postdoc training as well before moving to Harvard. And currently, he's the chief of the um, this uh, neuro oncology center at uh, Harvard the University Hospitals, like BWH Brigham and Women Hospital. And uh, he's uh, the editor in chief of Neuro Oncology. General and uh, he was uh, the past president of the Society of Neuro Oncology and he has uh, published several books and has uh, several awards and up, uh, upcoming uh, lots of upcoming trials in this field and uh, that's just a brief review I wanted to say about him and uh, so um, maybe we should let them ask questions and then yeah. I have a few uh, more questions. Of course, I will. Uh, uh, I I I will. I want uh, them to make comments. Melike, are you here? Mm -hmm. okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, Dr. Van, um, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. Melike, uh, can you uh, open your camera? Is it possible? Uh, no, uh, sorry, it's not. Okay. 
So um, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. So I have two questions actually. Um, Dr. Van, you emphasize that there is no role as um, prophylactic anti-epileptics for the glioma, uh, either um, low grade or high grade, not presented with the seizures. But um, looking at the findings from the Dr. Ringler's and Dr. Monge's and Dr. Sontimer's group, you know, there's an association between neurons and the glioma. And um, there are some studies that show the um, anti-epileptics could be part of the treatment. So what do you think about, you know, in the future uh, is the use of anti-seizure medications, uh, especially pre-adjuvant uh, therapy? And the second question is that, um, what is the what should be the optimal time interval between immunomodulators and the surgery or the lead procedures? Thank you very much again for the excellent presentation. Thanks so much for those questions. They're, they're great questions. So, so I think they're they're two separate issues. Um, just in terms of the anti seizure medicines, right now, you know, there's no evidence that giving it makes any difference in seizure outcome. I think Michelle Monge's work suggests that drugs that target, for instance, the AMPA receptor might have both an anti-seizure effect, but might also have an anti-tumor effect. So parampanol might be one of those drugs. But even though she's shown preclinical data of a therapeutic benefit, we're not actually sure if that's going to translate into patients. There has been a, a fairly big randomized phase two trial of a related drug, telampanol, which was negative. There was no anti, there was no prolongation in survival. But I think, you know, if we can show that these drugs both have an anti-seizure effect, but also an anti-tumor effect, then it would be reasonable to think of adding them to the normal treatment of these patients. So I, I think, you know, we'll have to see what, what the data shows, but hopefully that will be the case. And then, I'm sorry, the second question was the timing between immunotherapy and surgery and lit therapy. Um, so I think I tried to show you briefly that initially that there was a thought that maybe if you give PD-1 before surgery, there was a benefit, but actually, unfortunately, the validation study, which hopefully will be published this year, suggests that that isn't the case. Um, in terms of LIT, th there's a suggestion that LIT could augment the immune response. And so as you probably know, there are studies from uh, Washington University and, and others combining LIT with PD-1 blockade to see if there is a better outcome. But we'll, we'll have to see how, how much of an augmentation of the immune response there is. There was suggestion in many cancers that radiation may also augment the immune response. Unfortunately, at Snow, uh, my colleague David Ridden published data suggesting that radiation in PD-1 doesn't improve outcome. So, so even though theoretically there might be a, com a benefit with LIT and PD-1, we'll have to see if that's actually true. Thank you, Professor. And uh, Professor Yunus Aydın, uh, we want to take your comments. Ah. <clears throat> hi, hi, Dr. Wen. Uh, congratulations. It was really uh, fantastic uh, presentations. I'm a neurosurgeon. Uh, at the beginning, uh, you said the neurosurgeon gives more uh, corticosteroids. Uh, actually, in our, in our practice, we operate the patients and uh, start the corticosteroids. And the, after discharge, we uh, generally stop or decrease the doses. Then the patients transfer to the oncologist and uh, it's uh, the patients not at that point out of our hands. Uh, so I think there's, uh, there should be no criticism for the neurosurgeons. Uh, actually, but, uh, Anti-epileptic, Melika uh, talked with, I, I, I will not repeat. But as a, as a neurosurgeon, we, uh, we just the biopsy provider. 
as I understood, uh, our main job is remove the tumor as much as possible and then transfer, give to the pathologist and then uh, oncologist. Uh, and uh, as we understood after your presentation, it, it will be more complicated after surgery, which uh, test uh, asked by neurosurgeon, which, which test uh, should be done without asking uh, by pathologist and uh, what should be the ideal protocol uh, for the uh, patients because you uh, <clears throat> define your treatment according to the findings uh, of the pathological and immunohistochemical investigations. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think, uh, you know, the surgeon is, is so important. You know, if you can get a gross total resection, you, you really make a difference for the patients if, if it's feasible. But I think even if you do a biopsy, it's important to get enough tissue. You know, one of the mm -hmm. challenges is patients come to us and they have a biopsy and there's very little tissue and you can't do anything else except the pathology. But having enough tissue for MGMT testing and then sometimes for molecular testing is useful. And then many trials require tissue to go into the trial. So if you have no tissue, you have no clinical trial option. So I think that even if it's just a needle biopsy, to have enough cores to get tissue is, is really crucial. I think going forwards, it's going to be more and more important to, to have uh, molecular testing. Right now, you know, we don't have a lot of treatments that patients can benefit from, even if we know the genotype. But hopefully that will change in the future. And then going back to steroids, I'm, I'm not criticizing uh, our neurosurgery colleagues. You know, you need to give steroids around surgery. I think it, what, what I'm hoping is that the dosing changes. So, so instead of giving it four times a day, to consider giving it twice or once a day, which is easier for patients. But they, you know, with the dosing, you should choose based on whatever clinical need there is. Actually, in our practice, if we don't think about... <laughs> the anti odematous clinical situations of the patient, we can stop the, the corticosteroids and transfer the patient oncologist. And then uh, generally they will start again. And two times uh, in, in Turkey, they give uh, <coughs> steroid to the patients there. And uh, do, you, do you have any protocol or, or, or standardization in the US? Uh, for the uh, pathologists, uh, which uh, test uh, they should do uh, with the uh, glial specimen, tumor specimen? I think you know, knowing the IDH status is now really important. So, okay. so um, you can find 90% of IDH mutations with immunohistochemistry, so that's easy. But there's 10% of patients that have non-canonical IDH mutations. So if it's negative, you have to wonder, you know, if I do sequencing, will I find it? I think there's a study from Mass General suggesting that above the age of 55, if you have a glioblastoma and the staining for IDH is negative, it's, it's not very cost-effective to do the sequencing because you're very unlikely to find uh, the, the mutation by sequencing above the age of 55 in, in glioblastoma patients. I think we use MGMT a lot. Some people say, well, you know, you're going to give Temidar anyway. Why, why bother with MGMT? But I think, I mean, I'm, I'm probably in, in a minority, but I think in unmethylated patients, it's not really clear why we're giving so many patients temozolomide. Monica Hege, who you know, published the New England Journal paper in 2005 showing MGMT was important. She thinks that the few patients that benefited from temozolomide who had unmethylated MGMT in her group were basically just misclassified patients. They had methylated MGMT. And you talked about preoperative uh, therapy, medical therapy. Uh, do you have any protocol, for example, uh, uh, which uh, patients uh, you start preoperative uh, oncologic treatment? For example, uh, EGBM, is it included? 
I'm, I'm sorry, but perioperative, you mean uh, pre pre before or after? Before surgery, yeah. Before, before surgery. surgery. Yeah. yeah. Before surgery, you you said an alternative. Uh, some. Uh, yeah. Uh, what, what 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 is the indications? Uh, so, so most of them starting, starting the oncologic treatment. So most but of them are know. really to understand the drug better. So there are two situations. One is if you have combination immunotherapy, because the animal models are right now terrible. So it's very hard to figure things out reliably in, in the lab. You could give drug one and PD one separately to patients and you can look at the combination. And then you have tumor after surgery to see if the immune response is increased. That's one situation. The other situation that we're doing more and more actually is just to see if the drug gets in. So if you have a targeted therapy, say you have an EGFR inhibitor, you have a new EGFR inhibitor and you wanna treat glioblastoma. Regardless of what the preclinical studies show, you want to show in patients that the drug actually gets in, it achieves adequate concentrations in both enhancing, but also non-enhancing tumor. So it really gets in. And then also that it inhibits the pathway. Because if it doesn't do that, then there's no point doing bigger studies because it's never going to work. And, and, you know, we spend a lot of time doing bigger studies and it, it doesn't work. And then you go back and say, oh, well, we never got there in the first place. I, I've certainly been very guilty of many of those studies. So we're trying to fix that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Nana, I think you have okay. uh, your own questions. Uh, yeah. Uh, so first of all, um, I wanted to ask uh, regarding the viruses. You mentioned a few of them, and uh, as far as I know, in UK, it's uh, recently it's more popular to uh, use Zika virus. And I was wondering, what uh, do you think regarding that? They, they claim that Zika virus has a higher tropism compared to other viruses to the tumor brains um, and brain tumor cells. And I was wondering, what are your thoughts regarding the uh, ongoing trials and re researches for Zika virus? Or uh, gliomas. Uh, I'm, I'm not, you know, very knowledgeable in that area. I know Milan Shader at Washington University did the first studies of that, and he's pursuing it. And other people are also. I mean, I think I think these are all really interesting approaches. I think the challenge with all these viruses is that they probably have an effect, but the question is whether they have enough of an effect, and how you can administer them appropriately. Because a lot of, I think some of the trials that have failed have been, so for instance, a tokogen virus, you know, patients had a resection and then the surgeon injects the virus into the wall of the cavity. And that's a very inefficient way of doing it. And, you know, people are busy, they inject it quickly. Most of the virus just squirts back into the cavity and then you don't even get much of the virus. You know, whether we should be, administering the virus through some other means like convection, enhanced delivery is, is one issue. And then the other issue is whether you should give it more than once based on the total study from Japan. Because with most therapies, just giving one dose of something probably isn't going to be enough. So perhaps you have to give multiple injections. So I think the virus is important, but also technical issues like this are also important. And, and neurosurgeons will be the drivers of these types of approaches. Yeah, actually, uh, the study I mentioned was uh, uh, done in Cambridge, and uh, the, the neurosurgery resident was, um, I mean, the founder of this study. And I'm not sure what the final results are. This was, was kind of ongoing study. Um, okay, so another question I wanted to ask is, uh, what do you think regarding um, uh, stem cell? Uh, so, I, mean, I mean, the origin of the tumor might be the stem cells, and how do you? Th what, what do you think regarding targeting those tumor stem cells? Because the, those um, uh, tumors are known for being more, you know, resistant to chemotherapy as well. And I was wondering, what if you have any specific, uh, you know? Uh, criteria for the, treating this, the, those kind of tumors that have origin from tumors, I mean, stem cells, yeah. Yeah, so, so I think for a long time and, and to some extent, even now, the idea is that the stem cells gives rise to tumor cells. 
-hmm. and that if you can kill the stem cells, you can kill the tumor and you can fix the problem. But there, there have been a couple of really good reviews, one by Howard Fine in uh, Cancer Discovery and uh, another by Simone Niclou in Neurooncology in the past two years that have discussed this problem. And the problem may be that because of this plasticity and because of the ability of tumor cells to maybe de differentiate back to stem cells, that this approach of just focusing on stem cells is not going to work very well for glioblastoma. That this hierarchy might be more relevant for the IDH mutated tumors and for the H3K27M tumors. And if that is true, then you know being able to attack the stem cells for those tumors might lead to better outcome. And that could be an explanation why actually some therapies are actually working for these tumors. So I think this is an area that's still very much in flux. And you know, I'm certainly not an expert in, in, in stem cell differentiation, but it's I think it so far it's been difficult. Just by talking to stem cells, we haven't seen the kind of results that we would have hoped to see. Yeah, I understand. So exactly this uh, subventricular zone, for example, is uh, considered as one of the primary origin for uh, gliomas. And also this, uh, I mean, there is adult stem cells are localized there. And also the, the this is the same site where the tumors are originated. And I was wondering maybe it could help with the, you know, early detection, if not screening, at least early detection of the tumor or, or do you think it, I mean, or maybe highly susceptible people could be screened perhaps for this ventricular zones? Or do you think that's so rare that doesn't worth taking into consideration? I think right now it's really hard to screen. You know, the, the time from when you can detect it, presumably by imaging, to the time that patients are symptomatic is such a short window. I think practically it'd be hard and then you be hard to screen so many people. Whether in the future there would be other markers that that would allow screening, it's hard, it's hard to know. I mean, right now, as you know, even the blood biomarkers are not good for brain tumors. But things will change and things will get better. But I, I think right now screening is just hard. Okay, so uh, another question that uh, I wanted to ask is uh, what about the side effects of chemotherapy? Like, uh, for example, with the problem with memory, it might affect memory. It might give like Alzheimer-like symptoms. And I was wondering, how do you uh, do you treat this, or do you make any kind of prevention at, uh, for, or maybe are you giving memantine, for example, or any medications, or if there are any ways to prevent that? Yeah, no, that that's a great question. I think it's less an issue with chemotherapy. So temozole might doesn't really cause a radiation, lot of, yeah. but it's radiation. Radiation, and, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so memantine, I think there's a trial by Paul Brown suggesting it's beneficial for whole brain radiation. We sometimes use it in glioma patients, even though there's not data in glioma patients. But I think you touch on a really important issue because as we hope that our treatments get better and patients live longer, they're all going to end up demented, especially the GBM patients that get the big dose of radiation. And, and you know, as a field, we need to think about what other strategies might be reasonable to prevent these long-term neurocognitive issues. I, I mentioned for the grade three or anaplastic oligodendrogliomas where a third of them are alive at 20 years. I have a lot of those patients and you know, sadly, some of them are going to nursing home. So even though the tumor is okay, their brain and their lives are not okay. And so we, we need to, I think, think about it and do more research in that area. And, and it's an area right now where there's very little research, but it's a really important issue. And um, I mean, how often does this problem develop in uh, uh, patients with the radiation? I mean, what is the prevalence of the memory problem? It, it depends partly on where the tumor is. You know, if you, you have radiation to your Closer. dominant temporal lobe, you're going to get it sooner. But I think if you live long enough, you're going to get it. I think, uh, I, I don't know how many radiation oncologists there is in the audience, but the goal of all neuro-oncologists is to put them out of business, right? 
that we would have treatments that don't require radiation. And uh, I have one kind of complicated question. So uh, as I mentioned, the stem cell has locations in the brain. So the second one is uh, dentate uh, gyrus in hippocampus there where this stem cell are still kept. And uh, also the same zone in dentate gyrus is uh, the zone where the memory, I mean, the memory issues were, um, are also associated in the same zone. And I was wondering how possible it is, for example, for, the, uh, for those patients where you are planning uh, temporal um, low radiation, I was wondering if it is possible to uh, separate these um, stem cells in advance to freeze them and then to use them later on for, uh, for the memory, like, because these stem cells are also used used uh, as a therapy for Parkinson's disease, for example, or some kind of degenerative diseases. And I was wondering how possible it is to separate them before starting the radiation and then to um, return back to help with the memory issues. I mean, it's, it's just hypothetical, just that it was my own idea. Yeah, no, it, it's a great idea. I, I think if there was some way to spare those stem cells, whether it's from drug treatment or I, I guess you could harvest it. I think theoretically preserving it in some way is a good idea. I, I, I think right now there, there's just technical challenges to doing that. And then I think the, the other reality right now is that especially for glioblastoma patients, you know, they're going to die. So, so all this stuff is less of an issue. But as soon as we have treatments that really work, then it's going to be a big problem. So thinking about it and trying to develop strategies it is important because otherwise you You'll, you'll find a situation where everybody's getting demented and we haven't done the research to figure out how to prevent it. Mana, uh, shall we uh, turn on uh, Professor Achikir's microphone? So I like we ask it. his questions by himself. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. It's very good for us to hear you from Beautiful city, Boston. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you, welcome. Uh, I have a question. Thank you for your excellent presentation. What is your strategy about butterfly GVMs? Recently, this week, I operated a right-sided uh, GVM, just entering through the corpus callosum to the left side. It's very hard yeah. to treat them. Unfortunately, you know, we don't have anything special. I think by having a butterfly GBM, they can't get a good resection. And so they don't do as well. I think eventually, hopefully we can figure out what are the molecular drivers that make them, you know, track through the white matter tracks. And then maybe there are drugs that could target those uh, aspects better. But right now, unfortunately, we don't have anything. But it's always, I always feel so sad because those patients, they, they don't have a good life from day one. Mm -hmm. You know, even if they have good surgery, the only part of it comes out and they, they, they're they confused and they never have the quality of life that we would wish for all of them. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Maybe uh, if a generous can want to say his thanks by himself. He is a senior resident in our uh, clinic. Professor, thank you for uh, excellent presentation. Uh, we learned uh, new things about uh, this lecture, and uh, I thank you for uh, our team uh, uh, for this excellent presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Good luck with your training. Okay, Nana. Um, so uh, I'll ask one more question. I was wondering if you're using Xenograft models for your research or clinical practice. Do you test in advance before uh, trying on patient? If, I mean, I, I think the problem with those, we, we use a lot of those models, but not to test before because it takes so long to generate the models. You know, you can't get a result in real time. So that's a big problem with the current models. One thing we're, we're starting to explore, though, is um, one of our colleagues 
Olivajonis has developed very tiny nanotubes. These are just three or four millimeter tubes with 20 wells, and you can put them into the tumor. And each well has a drug. And so then a couple of days later, you can take the wells out and then you can see if the drug works. And then if it works theoretically, then you can use that for the patient. So it's still in pilot, but but it's um, these nanotubes I think are really interesting, and hopefully they will pan out. Because you you know it, you can put one tube, but you could because it's so small you could put three or four tubes and look at a hundred combinations, theoretically. Okay, uh, and I was also wondering uh, uh, if you use BMP four for targeting CD, you know, this uh, against stem cells, uh, CD133, this BMP4 protein. Uh, we, we haven't done, done that. You haven't? No. Okay. Okay, basically that's, uh, I've asked all my questions. Uh, there are a few comments in the chat section. Uh, so uh, there is uh, Dr. Bektas, uh, mm, Ajikos uh, says, thank you very much, Professor Wen, for your excellent no, no. presentation has, and sharing. He has already, he has already asked. So, so, I think Mariam uh, wants to talk. Mariam, OK. Go ahead. Uh, You're welcome. John. Hello. Thanks, uh, first of all, Dr. Um, Professor Patrick, for the interesting presentation. It was so interesting. And I, I like the question about butterfly shape glioblastoma because it's really hard to treat. I want to ask, during your presentation, you mentioned that if a patient hasn't got any kind of history of uh, epileptic seizures, we are not using anti-epileptic drugs. But um, I was a presenter in one um, onco neuro conference, and I had that topic as well. This was glioblastoma treatment, and I had my um, presentation about temozolamic treatment, and it's resistant, and so on, uh, and so on. So. During my presentation, I uh, also mentioned levatiracetam, who is anti which is anti-epileptic drug. So about that levatiracetam, uh, I found that it is not only uh, anti-epileptic drug, but also it uh, is uh, involved in inhibition of P53 regulation. Uh, and uh, during that inhibition of P53, uh, it also done regulate MGMT, which is uh, one of the major mechanism of resistance of that uh, temozolomy. So I'm interested in, uh, during uh, your uh, practice or the clinic uh, patients, have you seen such kind of cases when, for example, you used uh, or doctors used that uh, anti-epileptic drugs, not for um, preventing the seizures, but to inhibit that P53, which, uh, as I already mentioned, is down regulator for MGMT, because as we saw in that guidelines, uh, this mm, this uh, worldwide guidelines, the newest one, uh, we saw that temozolamide is one of the major treatment uh, option for uh, that glioblastoma in all of the cases mostly. So uh, the resistance of that temozolamide is really big issue for the mm, clinics and for the healthcare workers. So. Uh, uh, I have that second question also. Uh, this anti-epileptic drugs used for that inhibition of P53 and also how you are trying to uh, fight against that resistance of temozolamide. Thanks a lot again. Uh, first of uh, all, Mariam, can you introduce yourself? Uh, okay, I will try. I am uh, Mariam Natsu. Literally from Georgia, I'm student, uh, fifth year um, of medical student in New Vision University, and I'm interested in neuro so much from school, and I'm trying to attend lectures and gain knowledge uh, in that field. Okay, that's great. I mean, you you ask some really great questions. I think there is interest in whether levetiracetam has an anti-tumor effect. I mean, the problem is we use it in everybody. That's our first seizure medicine. So most patients are on it. So, so there are two conflicting types of data. There is a study from Korea that I think has been published 
a small randomized phase two suggesting survival benefit with the addition of Revitorastum. And they are actually planning to do a bigger trial to confirm that. In the opposite direction, Michael Weller has looked at several large phase three trials in glioblastoma and has found that the patients who were taking Levitorastam had no survival benefit. No benefit. So, so I think it's unclear whether Levitorastam has an anti-tumor effect or not. I think the, the P53 pathway is, is very important. I think, um, you know, I wish we had better therapies. That there's interest in MDM2 inhibitors, for instance, but but that's an area that needs a lot more work. So it's, it's great that you're interested in in this field. And hope, hopefully, you'll you'll focus on neurooncology and help all our patients. Thank you so much. So are there uh, there is one more comment. Uh, from Dr. August Mikhail Temis. So thanks, Professor, for a presentation from Izmir Katib uh, Celebrity um, uh, University. Um, so Derek is just saying thank you. All, <laughs> That's it. Uh, first grade in the medical school, first year. OK. OK, great, great. I think we have done all the questions, yes? Dr. Yeah. Sajid. Okay. We have finished all the questions and comments. Yeah. So I want to thank. Thank you so much. So much. And I want to thank everyone who joined us today, this evening, or this morning, wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you so much for having me. It was a great opportunity for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.